I've just finished reading the post-war arc, and like my heart after Marineford, the post-war arc comes to you in two parts. We have the Goa Kingdom section, and the Aftermath of the War section. And I have some thoughts about the Goa Kingdom section, because while I'm sure that this might have not even been a part of the original One Piece plan, I think that the Goa Kingdom section would have been great at the start of the series. A lot of questions and concerns that I had about early One Piece are almost all addressed here in the flashback. I'm talking about fleshing out some of Luffy's ideals that I didn't even think about, as well as getting some more time to establish the dynamic between Luffy and Ace, even making me completely reimagine how Luffy's Devil Fruit works. And while I would have wanted it back in East Blue, I kind of get why that didn't happen. East Blue is a very self-contained prologue with a very tight focus. It's like trying to establish world building and setting up themes about treasure and piracy and how that affects the population. It's trying to make you care about the characters. And it's a story about how Luffy got his original crew together. So maybe a side tangent about this like ace character that we won't see or hear about again for like another hundred chapters or so might have gotten in the way of that saga. The flashback itself is a story that attempts to dive a bit deeper into the backstory between Luffy and Ace that we just didn't get, but it is also developing this broader story in the background. It is interestingly enough like a much more compact version of the overall story, which I think is one of the reasons why I would have liked it at the start. The Luffy and Ace section of the story focuses around the idea of found family, which is something that we'll see like develop over the course of East Blue, and the Sabo section with Go Kingdom and the Great Terminal focuses on the Celestial Dragons and the story of those in control uh, versus the people, which is something that seems to be a stronger aspect of the story that we seem to just be heading into after the events of Endless Lobby going forward. And to give you context, maybe I'm just dumb and I didn't see it, but I didn't even know that Goa Kingdom was a part of Windmill Village simply because we never saw anything past Windmill Village. But what I find interesting is that like, yeah, it checks out the celestial dragons were shown visiting Goa Kingdom. But while most people just looked at the incoming celestial dragons, that was as far as anyone got. There was a strong disconnect between the rest of the world and the Celestial Dragons and the residents of Goa Kingdom, with like ideologies so vastly different and actions which has caused havoc to so many, which are themes that we have seen play out multiple times in the story. And the solution? It's piracy, which brings me to Sabo, because when it comes to Sabo, the charm of piracy comes from its idea to abandon your previous circumstances. Because it doesn't matter who you were before, now you're a pirate. It is the complete and utter indifference to aristocracy. And with a life dictated by control, to Sabo, the idea of piracy showcases a vast amount of freedom. I think this is why I also would have liked to see more of the Goa Kingdom section during the start of East Blue, because the ideas, events, and ideologies that both Sabo and Ace have deeply influence how Luffy acts throughout his adventure especially at the end of Goa Kingdom. But this ability to abandon your previous circumstances is also what I think appeals to Ace. It is the ability to abandon the title of Pirate King's Child and make it his own. I think it's also why none of the three characters have chosen to be a Marine. Like the ideals of the world government and its ability to like simultaneously ignore injustices and also seek petty amounts of justice has been something that has already changed Sabo, Luffy, and Ace's worldview being on the other side of that. And I find it funny that Sabo, Ace, and Luffy want to be pirates. Like they go around and steal to try to get a ship, but they don't just steal a ship. That just seems like an easier thing to do. It is totally a child mentality thing, which I think this arc portrays really well. When Sabo and Ace know that Luffy has found out about the treasure and the solution is just to kill Luffy. Like that goes a long way in showing how young these kids really are. But it also showcases just the worldview that they have been shaped by in the Grey Terminal. The story is very forward about that. Like, Grey Terminal is a horrible place. Like, it's not clean, it's not monetarily stable, and it's very violent, which were shown with Luffy just absolutely getting tortured for information. And somehow, Luffy never spills the beans. 
and Luffy isn't like saved by any actual figure of authority. That's not what Great Terminal is about. Luffy is only saved by Ace and Sabo. The closest thing you have to like an authority figure who will go out of their way and save you would probably be Garp. And Garp has, uh, has kind of been lacking in the father figure role. I already mentioned why the three kids wouldn't have been Marines, but Garp certainly doesn't help because Garp was barely even like an active role in their childhood. So one of the things that I've liked about One Piece, but that I've really liked about some of War Saga One Piece, is the idea of found family. While there are blood relatives in One Piece, like Ace and Rogers or Luffy and Garp, the story has been very focused on this idea of found family, going so far as to de-emphasize blood relatives to instead focus on these characters finding and relying on each other. There's this hostile environment, while also having somewhat neglectful role models, forcing these characters to rely on each other more and more with them attempting to leave their circumstances behind them. I think this panel here specifically with Luffy wanting to be Ace's friend because there's nobody else is really sad. Here in these circumstances, Luffy is just like Ace and Sabo. And we get to see how he is taken in and cared for, how over time the three of them just start to form this brotherly connection and just go out of their way and like cause utter mayhem stealing and eating and running away and such. Like my favorite panels are probably from that when like Luffy steals something and gives uh, one of the waiters like an IOU. Cause, <laughs> Cause it's implying that like Luffy might steal food, but at some point he's gonna come back and pay it all back. And I like this like compact style of montage where it shows us the characters growing together over time. It is a very condensed way of showcasing the bond between the three of them as they begin to develop into actual brothers. And then everything falls apart. That is, uh, that's an apt way to talk about this section. We dive further into Sabo's backstory by contrasting Ace's and Luffy's relationship to Sabo uh, to this guy which very much feels just cold and transactional. I mean, come on, this guy has like a replacement kid just in case Sabo doesn't do what he's told. And as a bit of a side note, the replacement kid, I, man, I just, I hate the replacement kid so much. Just that smug face. Like everyone in Goa Kingdom has this like, I'm better attitude. But I feel like the only reason why this guy came to pick up Sabo from Grey Terminal is because of the plan to burn everything to the ground and how Sabo, despite not being cared for as a son, is still like a valuable pawn. Which, you know, I, I think checks out. I think everyone in Grey Terminal knows about the fire more or less, but keeps it a secret. Not because it's shameful or because it's wrong, but because if everyone found out about it, it would just ruin the plan. It's cold, calculated, and transactional. To the people of Goa Kingdom, this is just a solution where the ramifications don't matter. And that is where it ties in to the broader context of the story. These themes are so similar to Sabaori. What makes it even worse is that like Sabo hates everything about Goa Kingdom, but cannot change it and neither can Dragon. That is a very, very sad reality. Unlike Ace and Luffy's future though, this makes Sabo's reality just even sadder because he couldn't run away. He saw the problem, tried to run away, couldn't, got thrown back into Goa Kingdom, then gave it one last attempt to run away and got butchered for it by the Marines. This is something that I wish we saw at the start of the series because this would have definitely changed Ace and Luffy's philosophy towards the world and would have given us so much insight. Like even if you were on Team Navy and this happened, you're changing sides. If there was ever a theme to encapsulate this saga, it would be the theme of strength, and it is encapsulated best, by far, with Ace. Ace's core philosophy had been to stand tall and fight pirates even when he was in a losing battle. Why doesn't Ace run away? Because he has to protect what's behind him. Like, is that reckless? Yeah, I mean, it is, but is it beautiful? Absolutely. The theme of strength is encapsulated by the fact that it is used to protect what you care about. And what we learn here is that a lot of characters like Whitebeard and Roger didn't fight for pride, but to make sure that everything they cared about was safe. 
It is the reason why when Sabo dies, Luffy wants to get stronger. It is there in that moment where both Ace and Luffy realize that they are not strong enough to take on the world. And so, Ace and Luffy train together. I also wish we saw this at the start of the series, just because I deeply misunderstood how Luffy's Devil Fruit works. Like, I thought Luffy had way more control of his ability, but here, we see him struggle to even get a single punch in with his ability. So, I thought that, like, Luffy could control the direction and precision of the move, but I didn't even think about the fact that he has to wind it up sometimes. But it makes sense! We constantly see him winding up for the bazooka move, even like with a battle axe move, he raises his leg uh, all the way up to the sky. And I guess I didn't register that as him like trying to get the most force out of that elasticity. But um, I don't know, I'm brain empty. That one's on me, I guess. I just would have liked to see more of Luffy struggling and then learning how to use it, similar to him uh, getting to learn how to use hockey by the end of this uh, arc. Because just seeing the more humbled beginnings allowed me to appreciate the scene at the start of Romance Dawn where he takes down a Sea King a lot more. We get to see how he has trained for this moment. The entire section of Goa Kingdom was showcasing how Luffy got stronger, and more importantly, why he got stronger. For Luffy, strength is important because without it, he lacks the ability to protect what he cares about. And so, Luffy trains up, and he thinks he's strong enough, and then his brother died. Like, what a beautiful way to hit rock bottom, by the way. Uh, sorry about that, but... Nearly halfway through the series, and at this point, it's been established that Luffy isn't gonna lose. While Luffy might have some challenging moments in every saga, he's always been able to climb back up and finish things off. So to have not one, not two, but three losses in a row, with Luffy losing not only his crew, but his family, is just a beautiful breaking point. At the start of the series, I found Luffy's strength questionable, but now we see the big picture. The format of One Piece showcases Luffy training up to a certain level, thinking that he'll be fine, and seeing the bar get higher and higher until it surpasses him and destroys him. Even 600 chapters later, Luffy is still too weak. Luffy is just like a broken kid that Jinbei has had to put back together. During Marineford, Jinbei has leaned into actually caring and protecting Luffy, showing him what his problem is. When Luffy wants to take Jinbei down, and then just immediately gets taken down in a way that we haven't seen anyone else take Luffy down in, even in that moment, it shows us just how high Luffy has to climb if he can't even land one punch on one person. I love Jinbei going from like seemingly not caring to wholeheartedly embracing Luffy, bringing him back into reality and giving Luffy a purpose again. Sure, Ace is dead, but there is even more that Luffy needs to protect. Connecting the themes of the flashback with this current arc. All right, so for everybody else in the world, things have been changing. On the pirate side, Ace is dead, and so is Whitebeard, one of the central powers of the world. And there's this beautiful burial for Whitebeard and Ace, which contains a very quiet, melancholistic feeling. And while there are a lot of characters mourning, I think we are starting to witness the entire world rapidly changing. One of the things that we see firsthand is the news spreading all over the world. We see a lot of civilians cheering, and it seems like it's a good thing on the surface. But what I like is that we're seeing a destabilization of power. Like, as soon as Whitebeard dies, everybody is trying to capitalize on the gap that he has left behind. We are immediately shown that rapid piracy has coincided with this new era that is being created in part as a result of yet another titan doubling down on the One Piece. We even see how it's affecting locations that Whitebeard had claimed. We get a random island with a bootleg pirate. Like, sure, he's really called Orangebeard. We already have Whitebeard and Blackbeard. You don't need other colors. Just bad. Bad pirate. Who cares about you? Um, but what I'm thinking of is how is Fishman Island doing now that Whitebeard doesn't claim that anymore? Because he's dead. 
Um, okay, uh, during the post-war arc, we learned that Doflamingo was only in the war because of ulterior purposes. Which, like, yeah, no surprise, every warlord was in the war because of ulterior purposes. Um, but what were those ulterior purposes for Doflamingo? Doflamingo talks about a deal, but what is the deal? I don't really know. I, um... I didn't speculate because I'm, I'm going to be honest, I, <laughs> I don't got a lot to work with here. But all right, here's what I got. We have been shown that a lot of devil fruits in the world of One Piece carry a lot of thematic relations to the character's goals, right? For example, the admirals are forces in nature, and that is also reflected in their devil fruits, which are also thematically relevant fruits being forces of nature. The most recent one has been Whitebeard, who literally shook the world, especially when he entered Marineford. And now Blackbeard, by setting all of this up and also acquiring the Earthquake Fruit, has also literally and thematically shaken the world. Beautiful. Thematically relevant. Okay. For Doflamingo, it is the theme of control with the puppet thing that he's doing. As to what he's actually planning to do with that control, I have no idea. <laughs> now, I think it would be pretty interesting if Doflamingo was doing the Blackbeard thing where he was playing 5D chess in order to try to control the world government. As for another warlord, um, <laughs> all right, look, I didn't really talk about Moria in Marineford, all right? I barely even focused on Orge Jr., which, you know, reminds me of another character entirely. Hint, hint. Um, so I can see that something is here, and maybe you can speculate on, like, where Ors came from, because he doesn't appear to be a giant, which, uh, yeah, I mean, maybe there are more like him in the New World. But I didn't even know if Moria was going to be an important piece of the story anymore. I think maybe Moria might show up in the New World if Moria managed to just disappear into a shadow. Like, assuming Moria didn't die and still matters and somehow took control over Ors Jr., assuming he died, which I don't believe, but maybe if he did, we can see Moria coming into the New World for a rematch with Luffy or challenging Kaido again. Or maybe Doflamingo didn't really kill him and Moria didn't really disappear, but instead Doflamingo and Moria teamed up for some reason. I don't know. <laughs> Those are my three guesses, but uh, I don't got much information on either of these. Look, worst case scenario, it does matter and Moria just does a whoopole situation and just makes like a shadow puppet store. All right, back to things that kind of matter more. <laughs> In terms of that world-changing destabilization, we see Garp returning back to Windmill Village in an attempt to secure a location in an almost comical form with a giant sign that says, Secured by Garp. And that is when we see Dadan. Dadan? And that is when we see Dadan, who has been waiting for Garp. And I love this moment. Even though she's been portrayed as someone who didn't really care for Luffy and Ace, when it came time for both of them to depart, they both thanked Dadan, which was a very touching moment. And I think this section just really drove forward how much Dadan cares as she just takes out all of her frustration on Garp. In the context of the war, Garp kind of gave Luffy a chance, but he could have done way more. And Dadan knows this, Garp knows this, and she will not forget that. I love Dadan's characterization. No matter what Luffy seems to be doing, Dadan is on his side. Like if Dadan was in Marineford, she would have done something, which is putting Garp down even more because he was there and he chose not to act. So with all of that context, now knowing that Luffy is front and center stage, I like this idea of being able to take up the mantle of being the teacher and helping Luffy get past that ceiling that he's reached. Because Law might have shown up and healed Luffy, and while it seems Law is on his side, even waiting for Luffy to train before going back into the new world, I don't think you want to use Law as a crutch. Same with Boa. This was only accomplished with the help of the Flying Fish Raiders protecting the Thousand Sunny at a unique gamble on the waitress's part. I don't really remember her name, but you know her. You know the one. Um, as well as actually trusting that Robot Kuma was on their side. Which brings me back to Kuma and Vegapunk, which I still want to talk about. Because with Vegapunk, I think there's like two ways that you can play this out. 
either Vegapunk is a mad scientist villain who is more like Hogback, which which is fine, right? Like, I think this gives us unique storylines with, like, Frankie and Chopper uh, being able to question his ethics in both medicine and technology. So it seems like we could have gone in that direction. Or, now with this post-war arc, I think we've gotten a lot more information that tips me even further into the other side of things. Which is that Vegapunk is more like a character akin to like Aokiji or Garp or Kobe where they might work for the world government, but I think they're a good person. And so I think instead, just like from a narrative perspective, we can totally see Vegapunk working with Kuma to, if not be a part of the revolution, then at least to help people within the revolution. Similar to like how Luffy isn't part of the revolution, but has done a lot of things that coincide with the agenda of the revolution. Though I think that still leaves just like a ton of extra questions. Like, did Kuma lose all his autonomy? Or is Kuma stuck in, like, one robot body and just, like, beeps and boops? Uh, like, he's talking in Morse code or whatever. Um, or is Kuma getting more like a one-mind, multiple-bodies thing where he's just, like, a sentient brain somewhere that just controls a ton of robot Kumas? Or maybe Vegapunk has, like, created a set of guidelines for robot Kuma to follow. Like, oh, you could attack people and maybe try to injure people to not look suspicious, but don't kill anyone. And the real Kuma is just chilling out with Vegapunk. I don't know. Moving on now to the two-year portion. So I think if there was ever a time to feel a sense of melancholy, it would probably be in this end section. Throughout this arc, we've been getting a lot of hints that Luffy was up to something after recovery. And what we see is that Silvers has been planning to take Luffy on a two-year break to train. Which coincides with Luffy going back into Marineford and ringing a bell 16 times. Which, okay, I'm dumb. I'm gonna just admit it here. I'm gonna be honest. Everyone was thinking, oh, Luffy rang the bell 16 times. You know what that means. And I was trying to figure it out. Like, oh, okay. You ring the bell 16 times, right? So is he trying to say that uh, you should go to Skypea or Jaya so the crew can meet up? Because those locations had a bell in it. Or is he saying that you should go to Long Ring long land because he rings the bell for a long time uh turns out it's not it's neither one of those um you're dumb i don't <laughs> you're thinking about it way too deeply um i didn't even see the writing on his arm which yeah um that's that's a good clue good work detective no, it actually makes sense. It's a nice way of explaining to the Straw Hats that a two-year time skip was upon us. And it's kind of sad. After the events of Sabaody, after how absolutely desperate Luffy has been to return, everyone now realizes that they'll have to wait even longer to see each other. With probably my favorite one being of Usopp. There's just this, like, deep friendship between Usopp and Luffy in which they've had each other's back just emotionally. Not just highlighting them as a crew, but specifically as friends, as we saw back in Ennis Lobby. Which comes back here, where Usopp is driven to be there for Luffy emotionally. Usopp isn't just coming back to Luffy because he's a part of the crew, but because he's his friend. And it sucks because even that is short-lived as like Usopp sees and reads the paper and realizes that he's going to have to wait a while to see Luffy again. Another great reaction is Zoro's who now realizes he'll have to train to go into the new world and is willing to put aside his pride and ask Mihawk, his, his rival, to help him get even stronger. It's, it's beautiful. Not only does it echo Zoro's theme of being first mate through Mihawk, as like Mihawk begins to understand more and more of why someone like Zoro would want to get stronger, not just for himself, but for somebody else, but also how we see all of our characters do that. How every single one of the Straw Hats gets stronger, not just for themselves, but for each other. It's the ability to get even stronger for the sake of others, which has been the main premise of this arc. To wrap things up, let's talk about the future. We have the four big powers minus Whitebeard, right? We got Shanks, but we also have Kaido and Big Mom, who we haven't seen act at all in the story. 
which is fascinating because we've been hyping them up for a while now. So it seems to me like we are setting these characters up to act in the new world. And that can be said for a lot of things. Like there's this UFO thing that I didn't even talk about because, because what? Uh, <laughs> like, yeah, that, that definitely came out of nowhere. And I, what, what? That's it. There, there's no analysis there. I j just questions, just a ton of questions. We got like Blackbeard getting ready to settle into the new world. We got rookies giving us a glimpse into the dangers of the new world. It's also showing us characters like Smoker and Aokiji who are also going to be continuing into the new world. And this section, I think, is just the perfect way to end off this half of the story. It is very reminiscent of the Grand Line, but just on a broader scale. Uh, you know what I didn't talk about? Silver's making his way to Amazon Lily from Sabaody, I'm pretty sure, by swimming! This man, right, this man swims through the Grand Line into the comm belt and just takes down a Sea King along the way? Man, that, <laughs> that, that's impressive. Hey, you know, you know what's also impressive? Boom, check this out. I got, I got the Patreons all here, all drawn up. Huh? All of which could probably take down a Sea King single-handedly. That's just a small side tangent. Now we can cut to the end screen. All right, for the time skip, I like to have just a little bit of space in between the next arc. And I like the idea of filling it with things that I didn't get to talk about. I'm talking about ranking and like future predictions and stuff that I didn't even get to talk about before we reach the second half of this. 